My relationship to the broader sort of Makey project was to examine making across three sites um, in the U.S. around project-based unit making. So thinking a little bit about how making can be mobilized by teachers in the humanities. So whereas we think about making largely in STEM or science, technology, engineering, mathematics, I was really interested in sort of thinking about making in the early years for the humanities or the social studies. And so I've been working with a group of primary grades teachers, some in early childhood, so pre-K-3, um, and some in a multi-age classroom, so first through third grade, around sort of the ways in which we sort of mobilize making um, with tools and technologies, but also as a collaborative sense of what, you know, the larger ethos of what making is um, to make a difference. So making's impact on the larger sort of community um, grounded in compelling questions that are derived from sort of families, organizations, and um, the broader school. As someone who has a really vested interest in sound, um, I sort of came to the project thinking about the ways in which we could play with this idea of sound making or making sound. So um, theoretically, I was really inclined to examine sound both as a design resource, so thinking a little bit about how sound acts as a signifier to give meaning to you know, a child's voice or about a particular cause or issue that they're aware of. Here we sort of can think about sort of soundtracks, how soundtracks create this sort of ambient backdrop of um, mood or humor, et cetera. Um, but as someone who's dabbling in the new empiricism and who thinks a lot about sort of the materiality of sound, sound also became this sort of vibrant mattering that came to um, envelop students through moving in the city. Um, and that has resulted in sort of pursuing newer methods and methodologies. Um, so one of the methodologies that I'm sort of um, really engaged in is thinking about the ways in which young children produce field recordings. So going out just as sort of a cultural anthropologist would with equipment to produce field recordings of the ambient backdrop of their city. So what do the sounds of South Boston sound like? Um, and that's become really interesting to examine with young children because this is South Bo Boston's increasingly gentrified. So how can we sort of locate sound as a mechanism to think about broader geographic shifts? Um, similarly, one of the things that comes with field recording is the way you sort of analyze or write up um, the field recording in, in your project and in data or in you know, journal articles or findings. Um, and so that has been sort of um, an interesting tension in thinking about how do we communicate with a broader audience if we want to disseminate findings through journals? Um, how do we sort of capture those sounds without reducing them to flattened text? Um, hearing the city of, of Boston is quite different than me writing wind, you know, cars honk, 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 honk. Um, so thinking a little bit about sort of what the field recording does. Um, another methodology that we're sort of really interested in playing with is sonification. So sonification is the transduction of empirical data like statistical inquiries or numbers or um, I'm trying it with visual data, so GoPro walks of community um, centers um, into sort of sonified data, which sort of sounds very musical. So, for example, if you were thinking a little bit about the number of steps a child takes to cross the street, let's say it's about 27, you could sort of qualify that in sonification to sort of hear sort of the notation of 27 beats per minute. Um, similarly, and, th and this is sort of all very new for us in thinking about how do we sort of take um, an ocular-centric enterprise like social science research and sort of transduce it into sound-based ways of knowing and being. Um, and largely there's no answers, <laughs> but perhaps maybe new ways of seeing or thinking about data and thinking about the ways in which sound helps us sort of hear things we may have missed in the field. So I think one, one of the things I'm really interested in unraveling is this tension of sound and noise. And there's been a ton of empirical research in the early years highlighting how noise is terrible for young learners, whether it be it sort of because of the acoustic environment of a, you know, an early learning center or on, you know, in contrast, the way noise prohibits early reading skills. So students are unable to sort of decode or comprehend text because they can't hear sort of the ways in which sort of, you know, um, digraphs or phonemes sound. Um, so that's been really interesting in thinking about, I think a lot of the work that students produced that had sound as part of their making, teachers or their parents sort of flattened it to noise. I don't like this, this is very noisy. So um, in the talk, I'll be presenting some of the data around sort of, you know, thinking a little bit about how do we sort of re-envision noise, not as sort of entropy, but as epistemological and ontological organization of, of children's thought. Um, and I think that that has led to productive ways of thinking about the way we qualify voice in early learning. 
So one of the things that I would say is new is, so I'm drawing heavily on sound studies and feminist new materialisms to think about sound as what Byron Hawk calls a quasi-object. So not only as sort of a modal resource or signifier that we can think about through a social, social semiotic lens, but as a vibrant mattering or atmospheric text that sort of um, pushes and pools the body. One of the more grounded examples of this is a lot has been written around sort of the ways in which sound has been used in war. So sonic warfare has sort of elicited, you know, um, veterans coming back to think about the ways in which sound still triggers, you know, reactions to certain events. Sound is actually one of the sort of forward um, materials for PTSD, actually. So the sounds sort of create this atrophy of a person relaying an experience that they previously had. Um, and so when we think about this in terms of the way of what sound looks like in early learning, I think it's just sort of taking a step beyond a, you know, sound as a resource for composition and sound as more than sort of a podcast or a soundtrack to a young child's um, composition, but rather uh, sound as a way to signify perhaps, you know, that which was there but is no more. Um, so there's a young child I worked with to, who was really interested in why certain birds in his backyard no longer came to the range. And it was because of climate change. So the climate sort of has completely eradicated how these birds come during summer because of mating patterns that have shifted because of the temperature. Um, and he was really interested in thinking about how can I use sound as a tool to sort of highlight what this space, right, and he was five years old, what this space sounded like, but it no longer does. And so, I mean, it was very much sort of a, um, you know, resource of signifying birds that no longer were there, like the black cap chickadee. You know, he created sort of QR codes that hung on trees in his backyard to sort of as like the sonic installation with his parents. Um, but I think that has really important um, implications for the way we think about how young children, you know, think with sound. Um, because when you're up there sort of playing, you know, on an app and you scan this QR code, you're literally hearing something that never, that you perhaps may never hear again in that space because of the envir you know, environmental change. Um, and that's, that, I think, is really interesting um, and really sophisticated. So I think, I think it's one, one of the things that I would, um, I would say is that you have to do some unlearning about the ways in which we are quick to represent or think through um, young, young children's work and play, but just the ways in which we were trained as social science researchers. Um, I've sort of adapted these methods of sonification and field recordings for um, students in my qualitative research methods course. And they've had extreme sort of um, hesitancy and sort of refusal of, you know, but what does this tell us? What, you know, how is this a method that actually leads us to generative outcomes? So I think one of the things we need to do as, as um, folks who are sort of imbued with the visual is re-educate the senses to thinking about how do sort of we take for granted dimensions of the inaudible audible. You know, we work in a coffee shop, for example, and that monotonous tone of talk or coffee shop music um, leads for us to sort of almost tune it out. But what happens when we tune it in, I think, is really interesting. Um, to, and I think that that's something that, you know, if you're interested in sound or sound studies, there's sort of a, a wealth of resources and literature out there that helps us sort of re-educate the senses of, you know, for, for the dimensions of sound we, you know, might take for granted. Um, and the other thing I would sort of say is, um, Really, it's about sort of playing. You know, what does it mean to sort of take a condenser mic and put it underwater and listen to sort of what sort of the sounds of a stream, um, either man-made or natural, sound like? Um, what does it, you know, sound like when you put on your earbuds and you walk through sort of the um, things at the library where, you know, the alerts or the alarms? You could sort of hear that vibration and buzz of your body going through a space. Um, and I think it's about sort of those taken for granted dimensions that we sort of just don't hear or tune into that lead to really productive outcomes.